Namaste. Well, I got a comment the other day from Camden, and he was saying, look, if you're realized and you know Brahman, and you are Brahman, then whatever you speak is as good as the scriptures. And I was saying, no, you know, there has to be some checks and balances. There has to be a link back to the original teaching. Just like in Lakshmi Tantra, you know, when Sage Atri is asked by his wife to describe Lakshmi, he references a previous conversation where Narada was teaching, and he references a previous conversation, see, in the spiritual world. So, this is parampara. We don't originate anything ourselves. We always go back to the authorities. We go back to the original source. That way, everything we say is confirmed by scripture and there's no speculation or cheating. You know, but then I got to thinking about what he said. And actually it's valid, you know, from one point of view. I should be able to just talk about the way it is, the way I see things. And if there's somebody out there who recognizes me, you know, like the first person to recognize me was my astrologer up in Mahabalipuram. And he was the one who, who looked at my chart and he said, wow, <laughs> there's no way you're not self-realized in this life. Um, okay, you know, <laughs> you, you nailed me, you got me, okay. You know, so um, he started encouraging me um, to just, you know, forget about all this mundane astrology. It doesn't apply to you because you're at the end of your karma and whatever little things go on in your life doesn't really make much difference to you. You're going to attain your destiny. So, you know, just relax and enjoy the ride, basically. And so that's what I've been doing more and more as time goes on. And I've come to the point where, okay, I really don't care, you know, how many views the channel gets or what people think of me or, you know, whether they believe what I say or they don't believe what I say. But if there's at least one person there who recognizes me and is willing to accept me for what I am and take my words as Shastra, then okay. At least I owe him, you know. See, the Western way of understanding is called avaroha, which means the ascending method. You get some knowledge and you pile some more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge on top of that. And you gradually climb up, you know, <laughs> until the whole thing collapses and you have to start all over again. <laughs> but realized knowledge isn't like that. Realized knowledge is called Aupurusheya, means beyond human intelligence, and it's received from higher sources. And this is called Avaroha, descending knowledge. So that's the Vedic system. So all right, if somebody recognizes me as a source of this kind of knowledge, well, okay, then at least for one time, you know, I'll talk about the things I've been holding back on because I don't want to, you know, assert myself outside of the parampara. It's, um, how can I say? It's a mark of a realized man, like Ramana Maharshi, always referenced the scriptures. You know, unless he was with his intimate disciples and then he spoke freely, right? Well, I don't have any intimate disciples, but there might be one or two people out there who are getting it. So, all right, I'm going to try. So, Avaroha, start from the top. 
you know, we have our four levels, Dvaita Vada, Vishishta Dvaita Vada, Vivarta Vada, and Ajatta Vada. So I'm going to start from my Ajatta Vada view. You know, when I lay down and go to sleep at night, I see a limitless ocean of consciousness. Consciousness is all there is. You know, anything that appears to exist that isn't consciousness is Maya. <laughs> There's only pure, undivided, boundless, endless consciousness. Now then, a tiny little portion of that consciousness gets covered over by upadis. And then, apparently, an empty space occurs. And this is called the pure creation. This empty space is actually also consciousness. But it appears to be dark, void, empty. So within this empty space, then Brahman expands as Shiva Shakti or Lakshmi Narayan, just depending on how you look at it. In either case, the process of creation is the same. The first duality is that between the consciousness, the object of consciousness, and the act of perception itself. Perceiver, the perceived, and the perception. This is the fundamental tr trinity. It's actually a trinity. It's not duality. It's a trinity. Huh? But for simple minds, <laughs> we'll make it a duality. But anyway, that's the basic ontological principle, the basic principle of existence. And then that principle is expanded more and more. You see, like from Lakshmi, as Vasudeva, three forms expand. Huh? Sankarshan, Aniruddha, and Pradyumna. Another triple. And then from each of those, now four forms, three more forms expand, and so on and so on and so on. Well, if you want to look at it the other way, from the Shakti point of view, the Sri Vidya point of view, you have the <clears throat> Supreme Shakti, Supreme Goddess, and then around her are all these other Shaktis that have specialized powers and like that. So that's the pure creation. That's the spiritual world. That's Vaikuntha, or whatever you want to call it. Huh? That's still beyond time and space, ordinary space. It's a special kind of space where there's no effect of time. As my Adi Guru used to put it, time is conspicuous by its absence. So then what happens? Then there's a cosmic egg, the Hiranyagarbha, golden egg. And Brahma takes birth within that egg. And that egg is the material space that is the home of the universe, the manifest universe, the space-time. Okay, so then that space-time, you know, all the galaxies and stars and planets and all that is created, and the different species of life, the scriptures, human beings, process of religion, self-realization, the whole thing happens in that tiny little space. Huh? The way we look at, well, looking from the bottom up, Avaroha, it seems vast. Huh? But looking from the top down, it's actually tiny. Why? Because it's limited. Even something that's very vast, if it's limited, in comparison with the unlimited, 
appears very tiny. So anyway, so I am Brahman. I am that unlimited ocean of consciousness. Then I come within the spiritual world and I have a, 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 an identity there. And my personal identity in that space is something that's so outrageous. <laughs> I'm like a Buddha, you know, like a Zen master kind of person. There, there is no thing and there is no body to be conscious of it. And so there is no consciousness and there's no time, no space, no action, no distance, no movement. <laughs> Whole bunch of nothing. And this is the gateway. This is how you move from one world to the other. So I'm like the gatekeeper. Okay. And then a step further down in the uh, pure creation, I have a role there too. You know, the goddess, especially Durga, is known for riding on a lion. And when she battles the demons, she can manifest like millions of lions. <laughs> well, where does she keep all these lions, you know? <laughs> and and who takes care of them, right? So in, in that world, on that level of consciousness, I'm one of the... Uh, boys who takes care of the, especially the young lions, you know. Now, these aren't ordinary lions. They're not animals, okay. They're more like human beings, actually, than animals in their consciousness. They may look like ordinary lions, but their consciousness is like way beyond. They're self-realized. They're yogis, huh? great yogis, and their pleasure is to serve the goddess in her battles against the demons. But in between time, they have all kinds of pastimes and all kinds of wonderful adventures and stuff like that. So I am this young boy, a completely different form than this, a young boy who is like the... Uh, not a keeper exactly, more like a brother to this young lion. And he and I are our partners and we exist in those forms as long as the material creation lasts, which is a long, long, long time. Now I was born in this body huh, on the duo dualistic plane, the Dvaitavada, I was born in ignorance. But I had this call when I was three years old. And I followed that call. And make a long, long story short. <laughs> in 2003, my partner was revealed to me. So he doesn't exist in this reality in a manifested form. He exists in the subtle reality. Uh, he exists with the goddess, with the mother. And so he and I have all kinds of adventures and he has all kinds of mystic powers and stuff and I have all kinds of spiritual powers and stuff. And we go to different planets and we have pastimes helping people on those planets learn the Dharma. See, so this is our, this is our life, you know. We're just young. He's, he's a, just barely, you know, getting his mane. <laughs> and I'm just coming out of this conditioned life into the spiritual world. And so I'm like a young boy. He's like a young lion. And then we're partners and we work together for a long, 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 long time until mother is done with this creation. And then we go together back into Brahman, you know, after, I don't know, 
billions of years or whatever, you know. And that's, so that's the story on the Vishishta Dvaita platform. And on the Dvaita Vada platform, you know, here I am, this old guy, <laughs> this old broke down guy living in Tiruvannamalai. And uh, nobody much pays any attention to me, and that's just fine. You know, just leave me alone. <laughs> because I have this tremendously fulfilling life within. See? So when someone becomes realized, that's their state. You know, they, they don't want to have close attachments and relationships in the material world because they know that they're all imperfect and temporary. So why would I want to invest my valuable time and energy in something that I know is going to go away? You know, I, I don't. And the quality of being on this planet, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh jeez, I need a drink of tea here. This planet is undergoing a mass psychosis due to modern technology, politics, and trade opening up the knowledge of Advaita to unqualified people. Let that sink in for a minute. See, because of colonialism and the printing press coming to India, the books that were supposed to be held confidential and shown or given only to those who are qualified became printed and sold in the marketplace. And of course, people in the West, when they got hold of them, completely misinterpreted them. So basically what you have is a bunch of people who are like barely in the Dvaita Vada consciousness, messing around with Advaita Vada. See? And of course they're going to mess it up. Of course they're going to mess it up. <laughs> like they think, oh, really? Well, I'm Brahman, so that means I'm God. So that means I can do anything I want. I can believe anything I want, and it's true. See? And this is delusion. This is delusion. You look at that movie, The Secret. And that's what they're teaching. You're God, so you can do, be, or have, or think anything you want, and it's all good. Nobody can tell you that it's wrong. Because you're God. You're the final authority. Right? This is the most pernicious bullshit. And it is... It is, uh, well, look at what, ha what is happening in America right now. You have like half the country in a state of delusion about the coronavirus, about the, the fearless leader, you know, that they elected, and all this crazy stuff that's going on, you know, and, and people... Uh, just are in a state of delusion. You have all these Karens and Kevins going around thinking they're God and they can, they're always right. You know, this is nuts, right? And of course, it's been building for a long time, maybe 300, 400 years. But once the cat got out of the bag, you know, it can't be put back in again. So you have these completely unqualified people. I see it here in Tiruvannamalai all the time. People come to Tiruvannamalai, want to imitate Ramana, right? Or at least they want to parrot the things that he said. They don't want to live like him. They don't, and they can't be like him. But they want to like use the cool stuff that he said to manipulate other people psychologically, and they do. See, this is delusional. This is sociopathic. And it's going on on a mass scale now in the US and other Western countries. So, as far as I can tell, there's really not much hope. 
for the planet as a whole. It's going to have to go through a tremendous convulsion. And, you know, this is why all the great saintly people now have moved on to different places. And I will soon, too. You know, it's like, you know, we tried, right? We tried our best. We tried to get y'all to accept the scriptures, but you don't want to. Like I was telling you the other day, every time I start a series that's based on the scriptures, everybody leaves. It doesn't get like one third or one fourth the views as when I just riff like this, you know? And it's nothing I can do about that. That's your mentality because you don't want to accept any authority. Good old American individualism, you know? No, <laughs> no. You can't figure this thing out by yourself. You need that Alpurusheya knowledge, that transcendental knowledge coming from beyond the duality, coming down through a chain of teachers from the beginning of time, literally. Because they only have the viewpoint that allows you to transcend the, the illusion. Duh. Otherwise, you're just going to create yourself another illusion and get all wrapped up in it. That's the only thing you can create in your current state, is a deeper level of delusion. And the only way out of it is to take the scriptures, and especially the mantras, the holy name is the key. You know, everybody has a door in their heart that goes directly to God. The problem is we've locked it and thrown away the key. And then we piled a bunch of junk and garbage on top of it and just tried to forget about it. And thinking that, oh, the scientists or the politicians or, you know, the ordinary religion or something is going to save me. No, it's not going to save you. The only thing that works is when you clear all that garbage out, all those wrong desires, and you, again, you find the key, and you open, and, uh, you unlock the door, and God is there waiting. So... The key to that door is the holy name. It's like knocking on the door. Huh? Well, any holy name is all right. Anyone that appeals to you, that meets your taste, your preference, you know, that's okay. <coughs> so you see, anyone in this world who hasn't spent like the majority of their, of their adult life as some kind of a serious spiritual student, whether in householder life or in renounced life, as a brahmachari or as a sannyasi or something. You can't have the qualification to approach the final secret because they haven't received the knowledge from the right source. So that's why we're going to continue the series on Lakshmi Tantra. Whether anybody watches it or not, I don't care anymore. It's like, you know, I'm okay no matter what happens. So I'm just going to do what I know is right. And, you know, y'all have to take that knowledge and, and do the best you can with it. Because nobody is coming here to be a disciple. What can I do, you know? I'd be happy to give you the guidance. But uh, if you won't come and surrender, you know, I can't be a guru over YouTube or Zoom or whatever, you know. That's ridiculous. It's just not possible. So, well, I've gone way over time here. But I think you get my point. Or I hope you get, you get my point. Um, and I'm always glad to hear comments from people, whether they're questions or uh, comments, especially about uh, those of you who have tried the methods 
that come from the scriptures and gotten some results. And that's the kind of feedback I just love, you know. So not that anybody is going to watch this long video, but anyway, <laughs> that's how it looks from my point of view. Okay, Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti, Aum.